Hello everyone, it's great to see you. And before we get started, I'd like to say that if you like this video, please like the video, it means so much to me. And subscribe, would love to have you join this little community. Today, we're gonna to talk about Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, or Chernobyl is what they're calling it on consoles, <laughs> which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and I have to tell you as well that I had to do a handful of takes just to get that title out of my mouth because Shadow and Chernobyl, I was trying to think about them really hard in my head and it was throwing me off <laughs> a handful of times, to be honest. Um, very interesting game. Um, it was developed by GSC Game World, which is well known for the Stalker series. They're currently working on Stalker 2, which, um, you know, following this adventure of uh, playing through the first three Stalker games, I have uh, just absolutely had a blast um, uh, going through and and would like to share, you know, it's not all peaches and rainbows or whatever you want to call it, um, but I was very impressed by GSC's portfolio and the game was um, published by THQ and um, pretty interesting. So I was just flipping through one day, I look on the PlayStation Store and all of a sudden I just see this title card that says, you know, the Stalker Trilogy, essentially. <laughs> I was like, oh, I gotta get that, I gotta get that because Stalker was one of these elusive titles that in the um, later 2000s, uh, I was very interested in following. And a big part of it was because the development of the game was quite elusive. I mean, it was first announced, I think in 2000, 2001 or so, and um, would go on to eventually release in 2007. But across those handful of years, everyone from gamers to their publishers were seeing like screenshots and gameplay and really thinking to themselves, where is this game? I, I want to play this game. What's going on? And even THQ at some point was like, okay, seriously, guys, we need to put something out. We, we <laughs> you know, get it to us, please. Um, and there were a lot of reasons why GSE Game World really took their time to set up and develop this game. A couple other interesting things that I know about the development was that uh, GSC used a proprietary engine to develop a game called X-Ray Engine, which was pretty cool. And the engine was capable of all sorts of things we see now with modern consoles, um, everything from HDR, motion blur, which was super new at the time, um, and also hosted a world that was uh, quite lifelike through something called A-Life, artificial intelligence. and so. You know, we'll talk a little bit about that too today. Um, but yeah, the game was quite elusive. I never got to play it back in the day. So I had just always seen these screenshots. And then I think around that time, the later 2000s, I had really started this um, transitionary period when the PlayStation 3 came out um, a couple years following of really becoming a console gamer. And so when I, when I dropped my PC, that was when um, Stalker had really finally gotten released and so on and so forth. And so I always missed out on, and it was always a series that I really wanted to check out. And also a series I was more interested in checking out further, because Stalker 2, we know we've seen some gameplay trailers and stuff so far. And um, I'm, I was quite excited and interested in the world that was building in Stalker 2 and wanted to kind of understand what was going on so far in the Stalker series. And so here we are, we're talking about Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, or Chernobyl is what they call it on consoles. Again, I thought that was... Um, quite an interesting name change, and I, I can't frankly tell you why exactly. <laughs> so if you know, would love to hear that information from you. So kind of just diving into the setting of this world, um, Stalker is kind of a hard game to talk about because there's so much that you need to be introduced to, not only from the perspective of the game, but also just from the perspective of what this title means overall. I've seen, I've seen um, a lot of people who praise and love this game and follow the community. Also, uh, quite often accept the jank that comes along with playing a game like Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. Um, and, and um, you know, I'll share some opinions on that kind of stuff as well. But the setup for this game is quite interesting. So um, the game takes place in a world in which following the Chernobyl disaster, which we're all somewhat familiar with, um, there was an attempt to rehabilitate the area and there was a lot of you know scientific development and research going on because what had happened and then about 20 years following that incident another incident occurs in which um something was something mysterious triggers this second chernobyl disaster killing everybody 
or mutating everything within this area called the uh, Chernobyl Exclusive Zone, Exclusion Zone, which is actually a real place around Chernobyl, which uh, encompasses about 30 kilos of real estate in that area. And so that's the environment in which GSC Game World decided to set this game. So um, you're taking place and existing in the zone, you know, some handful of years following the second Chernobyl disaster. And so, um, you know, at this time, there's mutated creatures, um, there's bandits, the military is there, and um, stalkers are there. And what they're doing is, um, you know, traveling the zone, searching for valuables, money, artifacts, um, all sorts of things, um, scientific data, for instance. Um, and that's kind of where your story picks up. So in a true Skyrim fashion, the game starts and you have amnesia kind of lacking all knowledge of who you are. And there's really only one key clue to who you are finding out who you are. And that's that there's an objective in your PDA, which acts as a little map and acts as a little log for missions and so on and so forth. Typical in a lot of games. And the objective says, kill Strelok. Okay, who's Strelok? Why are we killing him? Who am I? Why am I tasked with this goal? And um, so starting in, in the first parts of the game, you kind of wander into some little town inhabited by stalkers and a local barman who's really known for putting people onto jobs and things. And so he initiates you on kind of going out and helping around the area in which the town exists. Um, and from there, your story just kind of picks up and you go on this journey of, you know, st at the starting point, helping him out and then trying to get rid of this psionic device that's turning people into zombies and then adventuring further into the heart of the exclusion zone um, where ultimately you kind of get near the Chernobyl plant and a full on you know skirmish happens and you learn a little bit about who you are and you learn a little bit about the environment and the world. And I did find it funny from a story lens that they held a lot of this for really kind of the very ending of the game <laughs> to tell you exactly what's going on. Um, not only who you are, but just kind of what's going on in the world you exist in if you haven't um, you know, done some background research or learned a little bit about the world um, beforehand. But I did also really appreciate that the game is set in this environment in which you have amnesia, you don't know who you are, what the exclusion zone is, so on and so forth. And so it is very engaging as a player to step into the story not knowing anything um, but the game really present the world in that way as well. I, I guess a good kind of alternative I would present is if you were a character, say, in Skyrim, right, who woke up and you had no idea who you were and you were just in the back of some cart. Um, well, there's a lot of things that happen in the game Skyrim itself where you're being informed of the lore and the history and so on and so forth. You know, things that as the gamer, of course, you're not going to know because you're learning them for the first time. Um, however, the world itself... Um, doesn't necessarily assume that the existing player knows. I don't know if that makes sense, but the presentation in which the world and stalker approaches the player's existence is kind of different from the way a lot of RPGs would would do it. And um, so I did really appreciate that. I appreciated that the world just kind of um, appeared to exist and go on with or without you. And a big part of that is due to this a life artificial intelligence that's built into the x-ray engine that gsc game world used um, for the game and so when you're actually going out and about you have your main core missions but there are a million little random quests that could pop up at any time or that people could initiate you into and that's because a life artificial intelligence driving this game creates a world in which characters just kind of are doing their own thing like literally you could have packs of mutants or dogs, you know, roam around um, whatever kind of map they're existing on, and just attacking people ra randomly. I mean, there are so many points in this game where core players or, or core events occurred or people died like way ahead of when I was able to even get to them sometimes. <laughs> and so I thought that a life artificial intelligence, this, this, um, this system that they used was super engaging because it created a world in which, yes, with or without the player's engagement, the world was truly going on. You know, these weren't scripted AI events where somebody, you know, every day they'll walk down to the town hall at noon and then they'll go back to their home and they'll sit at a desk for two hours. 
this was just, there are, are other stalkers in this world. There's military, there's mutants, and time to time, they're just roaming around, moving around, engaging each other, killing each other, fighting. And um, so you're just the person kind of caught in the mess of everything that is the zone. And so I found that from an immersion perspective, what the story gave me was very immersive because of that. And, um, you know, the main missions themselves are presented through this series of kind of taking up these quests, talking to the barmans. Um, they're kind of giving you some directive on where you can go to, you know, oh, we have to destroy the psionic device, you know, talk to this doctor or so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, with or without your engagement in the world, things are just totally happening. I, I had to talk to some guy at a house that's like a uh, destroyed house kind of early on in the game. And um, w when you first show up there, he's getting attacked by a pack of dogs. And later I was supposed to return to him in the game. And um, he was, uh, you, when I came back, he was dead because another pack of dogs had just run up in there and it was just him. And of course, you know, it's kind of hard to defend against a handful of dogs like that. And, and he unfortunately <laughs> perished. But I just thought it was so crazy that like, this is a main quest character and I would have presumed that maybe, you know, um, they incapacitate the character and they'll like lie on the ground or maybe they'll get up after a time, but no, they're just dead. <laughs> and I've not seen the games uh, uh, ever do that in quite the way. And so, um, you know, a lot of the enthusiasm that I'm sharing in terms of the story and the immersion and the world right now is really just speaking volumes to, though this game is 20 years old, I think it's still so fresh and new in its concepts because there are not games out there that have really taken the approach um, that GSC Game World did when they when they created this game and came up with the story. Um, and so to wrap up kind of talking about the story, yes, I did find the story quite interesting. I did feel pretty lost until we got to the very end because of the way in which the world presents itself to the player. Um, and the story also takes place across you know, various um, dialogue conversations where you talk with people and they tell you kind of what to do and then you log it into your PDA. Um, but ultimately I felt like it wasn't until you'd kind of played through the story and reflected on back on it that you started to realize, okay, well, now I kind of see where it was leading me and why we were doing these objectives and so on and so forth. And so that was just my experience with the story. I found it kind of, uh, you know, elusive, quite like the game's production was. <laughs> but I did end up enjoying it overall um, when everything was said and done. Um, and uh, so a couple other things I wanted to touch on, just graphically, we're talking about the PlayStation version of the game that recently launched. Um, it runs, I believe, at a 4K 60 frames um, experience. And it was uh, quite enjoyable from that perspective. I mean, the game is from the later 2000s, and so it kind of looks like a PC game of that era. Um, but I actually did find a lot of charm in its style and in its design. I was reading a funny thing about the game, which was telling me that um, a lot of the textures, even far out of the map areas where the player can go, are fully rendered. And the developers would do some interesting things to get the right looks that they that they wanted, such as some of the textures were like pictures taken in the developers' homes, <laughs> where they just took pictures of a wall and like used it as a texture and so on and so forth. And so I thought it was pretty interesting um, uh, graphically how they handled that. But I don't have much else I want to share from an opinion perspective on the graphics. You know, when you talk about older games like this, um, you really have to take into account the time period in which they were produced. Um, and, you know, overall I can say that when you play older games, the one thing you want to ensure is that visually the game is not distracting you or is not presenting itself as a challenge in which the player can kind of navigate and engage with the world. And, um, you know, Stalker 1 did not have that issue. And so um, graphically I enjoyed it. Um, when you first load the game up, there's a lot of motion blur applied, and I find that kind of trimming back some of the motion blur is helpful in terms of just engaging with the world overall again. Um, from a per performance perspective, um, I experienced a number of crashes throughout the game's experience. I had actually one crash where I was going through some uh, rundown manufacturing facility towards an objective, and when I stepped into a certain 
when I went out of a certain door, the game would immediately crash no matter what. <laughs> and it required me to load back, I think probably 15, 20 minutes of time um, so that I could kind of re-traverse and for some reason um, avoid the crash. Um, and this happened not only in that situation, but many times throughout my gameplay experience where all of a sudden the game would just shut off. And um, so I'm hoping that that is due to the fact that I purchased this kind of day one because I really wanted to play it. And it's something that the developers have um, resolved ever since porting it to the consoles. Um, and, you know, also because of the artificial intelligence um, design that I was describing a little bit, um, I found that the quest design itself could be kind of um, hard to tell, you know, what was, what was really important to do, what was random. Um, or sometimes, you know, you'd complete something and then the NPC would die or the, the quest would glitch. I had a quest to go and clear out um, enemies from a certain, like a car plant or something like that. And there were no enemies there. And I'd gone there multiple times and killed them, but there was no way for me to actually trigger the, um, the objective uh, completed so I could turn in for it. And so I had a lot of these little experiences. Um, but all's fine there, I guess, in the, the graphics sense. It looks it, it, it looks okay for its time. Um, and also describing the world design and things like that. Um, I did enjoy the traversal aspects of the game. So the game is a first-person shooter survival horror um, with some light RPG elements. You have an inventory system where you pick up items um, and you have a weight limit. And the weight limit can affect a lot of the things in which you, the ways in which you traverse, such as um, if you begin to uh, become over encumbered, it doesn't necessarily impede you right off the bat and stop you from moving fully, but it'll drain your stamina excessively quick um, if you don't have a lot of, um, you know, weight capacity to work with. Which I thought was a pretty interesting way in which to set up the game because you will be traversing a lot. You'll be walking back and forth and all over the territory of the exclusion zone. And at times that could be middling. Um, and there are some ways to kind of boost your stamina, like you can have a little energy drink <laughs> to get you going um, and to bring your stamina up quicker. Or you can, uh, of course, reduce the inventory you um, are carrying. But sometimes that can be a challenge if you want certain guns, certain items, so on and so forth in your inventory. Um, I eventually landed on essentially an M4 with a nice scope and um, and that held me over for most of the game. And I played the game on the most difficult setting. And so I did find that the first person shooting elements were pretty were pretty clean. Um, you know when you shoot when you shoot a gun, it it seems like the bullets themselves have quite a bit of weight to them. Um, you don't start off particularly accurate when shooting those bullets. And if you play it on a harder difficulty, the enemies themselves are sponges. And I was watching a very interesting interview with um, Todd Howard, where Todd was describing, you know, combat engagement with enemies. And he was talking about how, um, you know, if you have six enemies surrounding the player, that a lot of um, good game design would ask of you to, um, you know, the enemy's AI, to fight you one at a time, essentially, or two at a time, just so that the difficulty did not seem to peak off too much. However, in Stalker, that's not really a thing. <laughs> if you find yourself in a firefight with seven people, all seven people are going to gun at you as hard as they can, as frequently as they can, until you're dead. <laughs> and so playing this on the hardest difficulty required a lot of save scumming. I saved and saved and saved and saved ex excessively playing this game. Um, and did often require me to sit at a long distance, peek behind a wall with my scope dim for and, and pop off headshots, you know, sometimes eight, nine, 10 at a time to kill one guy. And so if you imagine you're fighting 70 of them, that can get pretty crazy. Um, but not only are you interacting with um, human enemies, but there's also mutants. Um, there's a funny trophy to collect dog tails. So these mutated dogs, they roam in packs and they will come and attack you. And if you're caught off guard, um, they can kill you pretty quickly. I often would have the M4, but also like a little sawed off shotgun, which is really good for these close range encounters where you could do a lot of damage if an enemy was close to you. And that's because these dogs would sprint right up to you and, and maul you as quick as they could. Um, and so, you know, whether it's dealing with dogs or there's um, other mutations like brain scorcher and things like that. 
you'd have to dig into the lore a little bit about Stalker to really understand some of the mutate, mutated enemies you can fight. Um, but I did find it interesting to have a little bit of diversity in my combat style, right? It really did become a pick or choose of, okay, the M4 is kind of the most effective weapon I have overall, but maybe it's not the best weapon in all situations. And that would prove um, the case with, say, fighting dogs and so on. Um, so that's big parts of the gameplay. Uh, another big piece is collecting artifacts. And so throughout the world, there's these leftover nuclear artifacts that will buff certain stats of the character and some apply some negative effects as well. Um, but say you're dealing with the inventory issue that I was describing, well, you can put on an artifact that would increase your inventory capacity a little bit, will allow you to carry around the weight needed in order to just kind of travel with your standard goods. Um, or another one I had would apply healing to my character. So my health would slowly go up over time, which was super useful being that I was constantly in these firefights where I was getting totally wrecked. <laughs> um, and in, so there was a little bit of strategy and management there. But what I did appreciate about Stalker is it took out some of those traditional RPG elements we see nowadays where it's like, oh, you're a character and there's like these 10 skills you can level up slowly and progressively. It took all that out. It created items in which you could find through effort, you know, exploring the world and that you could then append to your character to kind of boost the skills that you saw fit for a certain circumstance. And I think in this game you can carry like four or five of those. And so um, just kind of talking about gameplay, the shooting was um, not reactive in the way we see in next-gen games nowadays. Um, the shooting really had that kind of, uh, I, I would say Counter-Strike 1.6 is a good example of what the shooting kind of feels like overall when you hit an enemy. There's not really a reactivity necessarily. Um, and graphically, it almost matches it in some ways, not, you know, fully, but um, definitely in kind of the character models and so on and so forth. Um, and I did really enjoy just kind of traveling the world of the exclusion zone and exploring around. Um, there's piece segments where you'll go into like uh, scientific facilities that have been run down and um, abandoned. And that's where I think the survival horror really gets in because it's where you'll you'll find some of the scariest mutants and things like that. And whether I was topside or in a place such as that, I was really just having a lot of fun exploring, learning about the world, understanding its mechanics, and really seeing that jank come through that I was mentioning earlier. <laughs> where you have all these crashes, crazy bugs, quest bugs, um, but I think there's a lot of charm in that, if you can understand. Um, when you just think about that PC era of like the 2000s and these kind of more open world games that were starting to evolve, a lot of that came to be and it was just part of the, part of the design of the game. And so I did find an appreciation even in the things that really kind of challenged me as a player playing Stalker. Um, and I'd often talk about sound and I don't have much to say in the sound space. I can't remember much of the music, but there is one song that plays um, kind of this symphonic orchestral music over the title theme, um, which I remember very clearly in my mind because I heard it so many times due to me pausing and loading or pausing and saving or being on that menu because I died, um, whether that's due to the various um, kind of physics anomalies you'll meet in the zone or, you know, again, 12 soldiers shooting me all at the same time right after we had a conversation. <laughs> um, but otherwise, I don't remember there being a whole lot of music in the game. I do remember that when those 12 soldiers shoot at you, oftentimes when you find yourself in a gunfight, you would just hear this barrage of just like just uh, this crazy sound effect that just guns going off that um, seemed to basically be one of the only gun sound effects for the whole game. <laughs> Another weird gameplay quirk I wanted to mention was that if you reloaded and then tried to shoot your gun too fast, it actually wouldn't reload your gun at all. Um, you'd put you know, you'd put two bullets into your shotgun and then you'd prime it up and I was often fighting these dogs, right? So they're coming at me and I pull the trigger but actually nothing happens because I didn't allow the little zero on um, my UI to change to a two. <laughs> just, some, just some really weird uh, little quirks with the game that I wonder if are exclusive to the console version or if it's more what people online define as the, the jank around this game. 
those are the big things um, that I really wanted to talk about. I think this was a little bit of a ramble and a big part of it is that stalker is a hard world, I think, to introduce and to discuss and, and really get the right, the right details laid out because I think just with the presentation alone of what GSC Game World did here, there is something so deep. There's so much lore. There's so many different avenues of, of interesting concepts you could explore in Stalker, whether that's looking at the nuclear aspects or the supernatural aspects or the politics of the world in which the exclusion zone takes place. And that doesn't even account for all the gameplay elements that we kind of briefly touched on too, from the gameplay itself to traversing the world or um, considering the sound, the graphics and so on. I did really enjoy the game and um, even having waited so long to finally try it, I think my expectations were met in terms of what I wanted to really get out of the experience. I feel like uh, because soccer was in this new era of open world PC titles, the open world concept hadn't yet been solidified, it hadn't been defined, and there weren't these core characteristics of like okay, if we're going into a new area, well, we need like a tower or something for the player to climb so that they can see all the icons pop up on their map. Um, no, there was none of that. And I really enjoyed the the mature perspective I think GS Game World kind of um, gave to the players and in, in, in really just allowing them to kind of be whoever they wanted to be when exploring the zone and becoming, you know, this, this stalker figure. Um, okay. Yeah, that's it. I really enjoyed the game. I thought it was it was pretty good. And if you've seen this kind of trilogy floating around in, in a store somewhere, I think it's worth picking up if you haven't tried Stalker and you like first person games and you like that open world. It was surprisingly fresh to go back and play something that didn't feel so um, curtailed to the latest generation. And so yeah, um, would love to hear your perspectives. If you played Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, you know, please share your thoughts and opinions as well. Um, and as always, you know, I appreciate you watching the video. Please subscribe, please like the video and look forward to seeing you next time. I hope until then you take care and, um, yep. All right. Bye guys.